Welcome to Love for the Truth Radio, a program devoted to encouraging you to be a contender of the faith in an ever-changing church culture. On Love for the Truth Radio, we will discuss current issues and challenging views along with biblical truth that can affect our Christian worldview and how we live out our faith. And now, here's your host, Cindy Hartline. Welcome to the program. Our guest today is John Leffler, a 50-year veteran of broadcast news. He was the assistant editor at All New KCBS in San Francisco, the classical music director for Southern California PBS NPR stations on KVCR-TV FM, and worked as operations manager at the PBS Network Satellite Distribution Center in Denver, Colorado. John Leffler has hosted the Steel on Steel radio show for the past 25 years, a weekly news program and early warning service dedicated to connecting the dots in the areas of economics, politics, and religion. Steel on Steel has always been a cutting-edge news program highlighting trends that many called impossible. John also co-hosts the weekly Financial Sense News Hour with Jim Paplava and host the popular 6640 program. John, it's a pleasure to have you on Love for the Truth Radio. Welcome. Well, you can reserve judgment on that till till the show goes by. Maybe you won't want to have me back. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I know you'll make me laugh a lot, so that's what's really important. I think I need that today anyway. <laughs> Well, anyway, John, we're going to just jump right in here on the cultural forefront. You know, in this segment, I'd like to cover the immorality in America, which is getting worse with the unchurched and churched alike. I know you would agree with that. And then America's uh, moral condition, I believe people think that it's because of prayer being taken out of the schools in 63 and the ongoing process of ripping the Ten Commandments off our judiciary courtroom walls. But you say much of our immorality or our immoral condition was caused by the rejection of the Western worldview, the feminist movement that started in the 60s. Now, that's the huge rebellious marker that has changed our way of thinking. And I've heard you say it has come to full circle from if it feels good, do it with no limits way of thinking to now the regulatory and politically correct thinking uh, that we see a lot going on today. John, let's just first connect the dots between the feminist movement to the politically correct thinking of today. Well, the feminist movement was just an off sprout of the entire rebellion that went on in the 60s. I was in college in the 60s. Actually, I was most of the 60s. I was working for radio stations in their news departments. Mm. And, um, It was a rebellion against the order. We imported Eastern religions, largely through the Beatles Mm -hmm. and the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Remember that back in that time? I don't know if you remember that or not, but he was very popular. We rejected, began rejecting things about Western civilization Mm -hmm. and, you know, what I call the established order of things. And, of course, along with that, won a rejection against uh, moral values that we had. You know, it was basically, if it feels good, do it. Hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. Mm. Uh, there were a whole series of slogans that came out of that. And, of course, the feminist movement, you know, th- there's a difference between women's rights movement. It was this it, it, effort to try to get some kind of not just equality mm-hmm. while people are different. It was almost to abolish the differences. And ultimately, the feminist movement become a, became an e-feminist movement, to eviscerate uh, manhood, seeing that mm-hmm. maleness was the, the problem with all the world, and if we could just have women running the world, uh, we didn't need these sperm bags for anything but reproduction, so if we could just get rid of all this male mm-hmm. aggression, everything would be fine. That was the, the myth, so to speak, that came out of that. Yes. And at the same time, we began, we could have something, we believed we could have something for nothing, which uh, seems like everybody's fallen victim to that, including the Greeks today. Uh, that we can actually tax and inflate our way into a uh, a, a poverty-free society that was Lyndon Johnson. All of these ideas started, well, they started Mm -hmm. earlier than that, but they bloomed into fruition, right, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of attack on our cultural heritage, on the things that we had done right uh, as a country. And in academia, you began to see this constant denigration of what the West is Mm -hmm. and what we have done in terms of human rights and trying to even put men and women on equal footing and everything else. You right, know. we saw that so progress. So that's where we started, and then by the time we got to the 80s, you were seeing all the wreckage. Mm-hmm. We'd been through 30 years of these mantras where they were just preached. We were all supposed to agree with them. 
And finally, in the 90s, you began to see the rebellion against that. That's this right-wing revolution that you heard of. It started with talk radio and moved on with the Internet. And now you have the two sides at loggerhead with each other. But it's ironic that the left, which started out by saying, there aren't any rules, if it feels good, do it. Remember, this is where the drug situation really mm -hmm. became dangerous, where it kicked off from with Timothy Leary and LSD. And now they've come full circle, and they've got all sorts of rules about things that are appropriate and inappropriate, blah, blah, blah. Right. So in almost every area, you know, they, they've contradicted themselves, Cindy. And I was thinking about today, and we uh, mix that in with now the postmodern thought. I know we're not going to talk about po postmodernism on this show. However, uh, we have talked about the topic in previous shows, so the listening audience is full aware of what that means. But can you imagine now mixing in the politically correct thinking with the postmodern thought of my truth is my truth? And now we really have a spiritual mess. Um, oh. I think well, you would agree with that. Go ahead. Well, 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 we really do, and the, the problem is is the people that believe my truth is my truth only believe that when it comes to philosophical, moral, or theological issues. They don't believe it anywhere else. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, when they're crossing the street, they still look both ways because they know it's either them or the bus. You no, know? That's, that's true. Um, so <laughs> that's true. so they, don't, they don't believe it when it comes to uh, daily life, and when it comes to enforcing their values, they don't believe it either. That, that so, is very true. <laughs> very yeah. true. <laughs> right. So, uh, all right. So how is politically correct thinking today progressively affecting our, our culture at large? Well, we've gone from the point of view, remember what they said, you're, you're, you have your truth, I have my truth. That mm -hmm. was the postmodernist view. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, we were simply debating whether or not you could have any ultimate meaning under existentialism. Now we've come to political correctness where it isn't, I have my truth, you have your truth. It's, we have our truth, and you better use our truth, doggone it, or you're going to hear from us. Okay, that, that's, that's exactly the difference. right. That's exactly right. And I think, too, I mean, when we think of back in the days of lots, I think we are vexed with that kind of spirit no matter which way we look, because it is affecting, I believe it has affected the church. But we'll get, we'll get more on that later on. But anyway, let's take a look at the media. It, it definitely reflects the conditions of our culture, and, uh, and culture will eventually depict what our media will look like in the future. So, you know, when we saw the performances, I don't watch the Grammys, but I did see the pictures, and we did see some postings on Facebook. But the Performances at the Grammys, I believe, reflect not only the moral condition of America, but our blatant spiritual condition. Uh, you look at someone like Katy Perry. She was a pastor's daughter who once sang Christ Christian songs, and now she's admitted that she sold her soul to the devil. And her performance uh, at the Grammys included wearing devil's horns on her head. Now, John, I know that you would agree that Hollywood and the music industry is shouting to the world what our culture is about. Uh, where are we headed? Well, we're going right back to where everything has always been when you mm -hmm. didn't have things restrained by a Judeo-Christian worldview. It's, it's not like this is new. This is old. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, I've, I've always wondered about this debate, whether Hollywood reflects the culture or whether it sets the norm for the culture, if you follow what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. And, and I can't quite figure out which of the two ways. But the real bottom line is, you know, you can sit around and, and deplore that all you want. Mm -hmm. If people don't grow up with a Judeo-Christian worldview, then your worldview is going to look pretty stupid to them. Right. And they're not going to have a moral base. They're going to make it up as they go along, and That's it true. always in involves some form of unrestricted licentiousness. But remember, there's that caveat in there. There's, if they're not saying it's unrestricted anymore. They're having to put certain restrictions on it while letting some of the other stuff go. Mm -hmm. So they won't go back and do what we did before that we knew worked in terms of sexual mores. But nevertheless, they're applying new ones and yet saying other things don't apply. It's a very confusing mix. It's very difficult I agree with for you. young people to grow up like this Absolutely. because they're getting mixed messages. Mm -hmm. They absolutely and are. They're thinking that they have to be sexual, sexually promiscuous, that mm -hmm. they have to have all of this good looks. It's all based on physical things. And it's driving young people a little nutty. If you talk to them a lot, I spend a lot of time trying to talk to them when I can. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they're a mixed-up generation because they don't understand what's up and what's down. That's right. Well, they don't have any, have any foundation. You know, uh, like you said, there's nothing new. You know, it's been like this for ages. But, you know, I don't remember growing up like this. Uh, to me, I, unless I'm looking at things in hind feet, but, boy, it just seemed like we had a more stable uh, country back in the days when I grew up. Anyway, yeah, we did. We, we did. did. I mean, yeah. It, I, it, but when I say what wasn't like it, it wasn't in your day 
or my day, but if we go back through history, right. you can find many places where it was like that, and it'll exactly. always degenerate like that. I mean, even Paul talks about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right, but I, I'm, I feel like we're seeing the, the ancient Bible days, looking at what's going on with ISIS and everything. You know, like, who would have thought that we would see the day where people are open, openly being burned or crucified or their heads chopped off, so it's just, it, we're, we're just seeing a different kind of day. But anyway, that same rebellion from the 60s uh, has entered not only in, the, in our society, but I believe now it's uh, tainting our church and the doctrines. Uh, I think you would agree on that. Yeah, Francis Schaeffer always said that the church arrives last at every new fad that comes along. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And he said, just as the world is ready to move on, the church arrives at it and acts as if it's the latest and greatest type of stuff. That's true. You know? <laughs> That's true. Uh, and you're seeing that because what's happening is is a mix of a lack of rootage in almost all denominations in certain places. Uh, in, in some Protestant churches, it's probably a rootage in the Bible. In Catholic or Orthodox churches, it's a rootage in its uh, tradition, plus the scriptures on top of that. Mm -hmm. And because of that lack of rootage, then it becomes really susceptible to everything that comes along. The Catholic Church went through Vatican Council, too, and the Catholic Church used the teaching authority of the magisterium to hold the whole thing together between yeah, Pius the Ninth and mm -hmm. Pius the uh, I'm sorry John the Twenty Third. When that lid was taken off, kaboom! And you found I was in Catholic seminary at the time studying to be a priest, and I remember a lot of these priests and nuns running all over the place, uh, trying to embrace all sorts of quote new ideas, which mm -hmm. in reality were just Marxism and socialism. It's where the social justice, the peace and justice movements came from. They have nice-sounding words, but you always have to ask what that means. Right. And we began to see this whole shift. And in the Catholic Church, there's a battle going on right now mm -hmm. uh, between the, the real conservative elements that believe they should adhere to traditional Catholic doctrine mm -hmm. and those who want to do all sorts of new things. You now see it in the Evangelical Church with the Rick Warren. Yes. Uh, the ideas that Rick is espousing are nothing new. Mm -hmm. They aren't Christian. They're not biblical. They come in from other ideas. Uh, from other people that are non-Christians, and yes, so true. you're seeing this dilution of doctrine. There is, yeah. And you know what, uh, our, uh, not to change the subject, but our government uh, seems to be leaning more and more towards anti-Semitism, and the Church is picking that up. You know, the, uh, we know that the Bible is clear that believers should be, uh, be blessing Israel. However, many of the churches have adopted anti-Semitism uh, as, you know, an attitude as well. And that's what I was saying, too, is that we have this rebellion that has entered into uh, the Catholic Church, the Evangelical Church, and right into our, our, our doctrines, I believe. But um, we're seeing this anti-Semitism thing going on, and then now our kids are catching on to it. John, you were talking about the BDS movement that's on the rise right now. Why don't you explain to our listening audience what that is about? Well, that affects Israel, and the whole narrative of Israel has flipped over or been flipped over deliberately by an intentional campaign mm -hmm. from being the underdogs to being the oppressors, you know, mm -hmm. which is why it's the nouveau chic, so to speak, to, mm -hmm. or nouveau, sorry, nouveau chic to, um, to say Israel's an oppressor colonizing nation and it doesn't belong there. The BDS movement, of course, is the boycott, divest, mm -hmm. and sanctions movement, that we should sanction Israel or boycott the products or um, divest of interest going on there. Of course, if you did that, by the way, you'd have to shut down all the computers everywhere because almost That's everything right. runs That's on right. <laughs> on uh, technology which comes out of Israel. Very few people know that. You well, know, maybe that we better tell our kids are... that because the college kids would not be able to live without their computers. Yeah, wouldn't be able to live without it. Yeah. And what's mass right now, now the anti-Semitism you mentioned in the church isn't anything new, don't forget. The anti we, we have to split that out. The evangelical one, the biblical one you mentioned is about 150 years old, something like that. That's new on the street. Replacement theology has ruled the roost in most of the mainline denominations for, what, 1,500 years, 1,600 years, somewhere in there. We're going on a break. We'll be right back on our segment two. We'll be talking about the religious forefront, so please stay tuned. If you're a first-time listener, you'll find that on Love for the Truth Radio, we discuss news and views through a biblical worldview. We believe that the Bible is the inherent Word of God and the absolute truth that should be applied to every aspect of life. We don't proclaim to have a cap on the truth, but we do have a love for biblical truth. 
So please take everything you hear on this radio show to study and prayer. And thank you for listening to Love for the Truth Radio. If you just tuned in with us today is John Leffler, a 50-year veteran of broadcast news and currently host of Steel on Steel. In this segment, we will be covering the religious forefront and how we are moving rapidly towards the one world faith. Uh, you know, John, um, you, you would agree with me that, uh, that God gives nations the leaders that people want and deserve. And, you know, all eyes seem to be on newly appointed uh, or this newly appointed charismatic leader of Greece called Alexis Tsipras, who the news calls the mystery man because he literally came out of nowhere. Uh, Christians, we well, you know how they get sometimes. They're calling him the possible Antichrist and all that stuff that goes with it. But he was the first leader of a left-wing party that met with the head of the Roman Catholic Church, Pope Francis. Now, it has been said that Tsipras uh, and the Pope get along famously are in, and are in one accord, and they are both ecumenical and very green, uh, even though Tsipras uh, is a staunch atheist. Now, what do you think of that? Well, it's interesting that he would meet with the Pope because Greek Orthodoxy is the not, I don't know if it's the official religion, but of course that's the seat mm -hmm. of uh, Greek Orthodoxy in the, uh, in the Orthodox churches. Remember, the Orthodox churches are what are called autocephalous churches. Mm -hmm. So that's Eastern Catholicism, and they're all separate under a different bishop. Um, Cyprus is an interesting guy. He, you're, you're going to see this more and more. You're also going to see very strange uh, bedfellow relationships. I've mm -hmm. been predicting that since 2000, where groups that were normally antagonists to each other would actually join together for causes to, right. to deal with. Yeah. Um, basically, Greece is like the pig countries, as they're called, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, Italy, uh, Spain. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Spain. Um, and they have not been mining their financial P's and Q's. And, of course, when they brought the euro together, they locked all these currencies together and their insipid problems into one currency. Well, the strong currencies, among them being the Deutsche Mark, the franc, the French franc, and the British pound. And so the problem now is, and, and of course the British were smart enough to keep the pound somewhat separate from that whole nonsense. They saw this problem coming. Right. It's interesting how Britain has always been suspect of all the great euphorias running around the continent. Right. And that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. That's nothing <laughs> new, you know. Um, but they locked in all of the debt and the problems of societies like Greece, which have had these very liberal social spending societies, mm -hmm. have amassed uh, incredible amounts of debt. And the problem is, is sooner or later, and we're going to face that here in this country, you have to tell, you have to say, Mother Hubbard's cupboard is bare, right. that we, we can't service this debt anymore. But, of course, when you tell the people that, they don't want that, because the way out of the debt is either a big crash or mm -hmm. a hard austerity program. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two ways out. And up until that moment, their politicians have been telling them, enjoy the ride, live, live, you know. Right. Uh, Greece is one of those countries where uh, tax evasion is a national sport, and so their revenue collection has not been great, and their spending has been terrific, and they did it all by inflating the drachma. Well, when you locked it into the euro... Um, the Germans were not about to finance the Greek spending spree. That's where all this tension came from. Mm -hmm. Now, the people are re rebelling in Greece, and so what are they going to do? They're going to elect someone who tells them that the party can go on. Okay. okay. I was going to ask and you that. What does he have to do with all this? <laughs> what is who? Well, I was, I was going to ask you, what does Elise's uh, Cipras have to do with all this? Because he's telling them, just like Francois Hollande did when he came in in France, okay? Mm -hmm. He said the party is going to continue. We don't have to cut back. We can, consider our, can, uh, can continue our great benefits and our exorbitant spending on social programs. Don't worry about it. And so, of course, you know, you tell them that, people are going to elect him. Now he's in conflict with the euro because, unfortunately, he's not going to get out of this very easily. Mm -hmm. And so the real thing will be to see... Where will Tsipras stand at the end of his first term in office when he has probably not delivered on much of his promises? Mm -hmm. I mean, after a while, the bravado only goes a certain distance. Mm -hmm. Hollande tried to do the same thing, being very leftist, very socialist. Europe has never, Cindy, ever been able to shake its love affair with socialism. Right. It, is, it has tried it in every single form. It's tried it in its fascist form. Yes, it's, it's tried true. it in its Marxist form. And now it's trying in its democratic form. That's and it just can't swallow the idea that socialism doesn't work. 
Okay, so what, what do you think that uh, he has going on now with the Pope? What's their agenda? You know, I've been trying to figure that out. I tend, <laughs> That's why I, I asked you. <laughs> I, I tend to like Pope Francesco ever, ever since the day he was elected. Um, bear in mind that he comes from Argentina. Argentina has been a terribly unstable country. Remember, he grew up in the 30s mm-hmm. and was there, obviously, for the whole tenure of Juan Perón and the Peronistas and others. Um, he's also a Jesuit. The Jesuits have been leading advocates of liberation theology along with the Marinolers in Latin America. Right, that's a scary. Isn't he the first? Not, not going to rabbit trail, but isn't he? The, he's the first Jesuit, isn't he? First Jesuit to occupy the the papal throne, mm-hmm. um, because the the superior general of the Jesuits, who is based in Rome, has always been called the Black Pope, meaning that because he wears a black cassock mm-hmm. instead of white, like the uh, the Pope does. So, but yes, he's the first Jesuit to be elected. He has a terrific heart for the poor. Now, here comes the comma and the but. The problem is, is a lot of times people that have a terrific heart for the poor also think that socialism is the answer to everything. There you go. Okay, that's the key. And that's the crux of what you're facing right now. Now, he's going to come out with a pronouncement on uh, green movement. He's supposed to have an uh, Mm -hmm. an papal encyclical coming out Mm -hmm. very shortly on that, and I'm holding my breath because he'll probably endorse what is now currently a failing hypothesis of man-made global warming, at least as being anything substantial that we have to worry about, mm. and the implications that we don't care about the environment. Right. Uh, and I, I radically challenge that, but any environmental policy has got to be based on sound science and sound economics. And what happened is, is early on, we, there were a lot of problems in our country. There was pollution, there were rivers that you couldn't drink out of, etc. We did have to clean that stuff up. But very early on, the movement was hijacked by radical socialist leftists Mm -hmm, who said that democracy had to go, capitalism had to go, Mm -hmm. socialism and a top-down managed economy was the only thing that was going to save the environment. And frankly, it would be better off if mankind would go. Mm -hmm. So now the church, as I always said, arriving late, Mm -hmm. just as there's a turn going on and people are going in another direction, is rushing in to endorse the green movement, but they ha- they can't make a distinction between the green socialism and the real scientific environmentalism, which is needed to to keep the environment. So I'm waiting to see. I don't think the uh, the jury is the jury's still out on this whole thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I have seen him extend a palm branch to evangelicals. Now he has seen what's happened in Latin America. A Roman Catholicism in Latin America is a different creature than you see it here in the United States in the English-speaking world. And quite often, over the last 400 years, it was part of the very conservative establishment that really just didn't give too much of a rip about the poor. Mm-hmm. Um, and it would always align itself that way. There has been more ink spilled on this subject in the Spanish language than you can imagine. The reaction to that was liberation theology. Uh, liberation theology was Marxism. Mm-hmm. with a peanut butter coating of Catholic doctrine thrown over the top. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think, and I think that's right. what we, we're seeing this going on, especially, I think, through the Pope, too, with, with his uh, uh, being very liberal as he is. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we move on from here, um, John, that, you know, we see Pope Francis, because, again, you know, all eyes right now are looking at the Pope, and they're watching Tispras now, uh, Cipras, I'm sorry, said his name wrong. Um, and, do you, you know, we're wondering, is he a game changer? You know, what, what's going on with the connection? We're, we're also seeing Pope Francis. Uh, he's been, as you said, too, one of the most liberal popes ever. He's certainly making his rounds in meeting famous religious people. We see his former meetings with uh, Word of Faith Movement leader Kenneth Copeland, the Robinsons, Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, who we know is very ecumenical. And now this uh, leader as the famous uh, atheist, charismatic leader of Greece. What do you think now the Pope's agenda is? Do we see a one-world faith forming here? Well, that's a question I've sort of been asking. By the way, what I was going to finish in my previous statement, which was important, is that evangelicalism has gone ripping through Latin America. Okay. Uh, And it succeeded in doing in Latin America what Catholicism had not succeeded in doing. Okay. Uh, That was providing the people with a a moral base when people come to Christ, largely through the evangelical churches, their lives change, they stop being drunks, they take care of their families, they aren't as fanatic about football and letting it consume their lives. 
It's actually changing the fabric. And the Pope has seen this, Mm -hmm. that the Catholic Church has not been able to do it. So now, zoom out, go to where you're talking about. (laughs) Uh, This this is something where I've been wringing my hands for a long time, or wringing my brains, Mm -hmm. because the end-time religion, as it is portrayed in the Bible, and Catholicism don't really match, okay? But on the other hand, Catholicism, as a structure... The Roman Church, not the Orthodox. Remember, Orthodox are right. autocephalous, and the Roman Catholic Church is a monarchic church. It rules from top down. has the largest global religious structure in the world. It yes. has embassies. You know, they call them nuncios. It has nuncios in every major capital that I know of, it's, as well as a pretty good intelligence network. However, for it to become the description that we see in the book of Revelation, and I know the Seventh-day Adventists and a lot of fundamentalists have been saying for a long time the Pope is the Antichrist, and this goes back to stuff that came out of the Reformation. But, you know, I'm holding judgment. In order for that church to, to do it, it would have to gut itself of its theology and just keep the structure and have a new system put in. Mm-hmm. So is the amount of co-opting going on right now what we're seeing? I don't know. I, I, don't, I think the jury's out on that one yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, we and, do see... and there's, e- there's even a battle inside Catholicism, by the way, over this whole thing. In mm-hmm. other words, the conservative Catholics recognize that there's a serious problem, and that's the fight. It's an ongoing uh, civil war with inside Roman Catholicism. Yeah, but we do see even in the emergent church, they're going back to the Desert Fathers to bring in the spiritual mysticism. They're doing a lot of the practices that Catholicism uh, does. So I don't know if you know too much about the emergent church, but we're actually seeing that amongst evangelicals now. <clears throat> that I know. I, in, a, in all honesty, I have a hard time getting jazzed about going back to some of the mysticism. I mean, whether I'm not enthralled, enthralled by it, but I understand it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not sure. I, I think that's almost a distraction from the real core thing. You know, yes, they're going back to practices that Rome, but not just Rome, but I mean the Eastern Church practiced that as well in the early part of the right. Church. You had aesthetics, you had some mystics and stuff. That to me is, you know, it, it doesn't ring right as the real core crisis. Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, because, well, we have so much going on, you know, it's not, it's New Age coming in, spiritual misses. we've got all kinds of practices and false teachings and false doctrines coming through right. the doors of the church, but I think what we're trying to say is, okay, what does this have to do with Rome? I mean, all you hear is that the church is going back to Rome, I mean, that we're headed back in that direction. What does that mean as far as the one world faith? And I think that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's a legitimate question to ask. But see, you're seeing that from the point of view of of a Christian, right. and I mean within with inside Christianity, we'll use the loose term Christianity, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, but then, how do you roll in the Muslims? How are you going to roll in the Jews? Yeah, how are you going to roll in the yeah. Hindus? That's right. Um, if you're going to talk about a global religion, it's got to be something that's syncretistic enough mm-hmm. that everybody somehow goes with, or uh, the, the beast and the false prophet come along and they do signs and wonders so much that everybody manages to roll them into their own religion. So, I mean, that's, that's why we're not... To, remember, Jesus said it's a faithless, wicked generation that seeks for a sign. We're not to base our religion on signs. We're going on a break. We'll be right back with John Leffler to talk about the economical forefront. So please stay tuned. Many would agree that we are living in unprecedented times grave immorality is on the rise, as in the days of Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. There are wars and rumors of wars as nations rise against nations. Prophecy is being fulfilled as the birth pangs become quicker and harder. These are the signs of the return of Jesus Christ. There is one sign often left untaught. Jesus also told the disciples in the Olivet Discourse to take heed that no man deceive you. This warning applies to us too. Deception has infiltrated the churches through many false teachings and movements, making apostasy paramount. As contenders of the faith, we do our best to research and discuss these false teachings for you, the listener. Thank you for having a love for the truth. Welcome back. I'm Cindy Hartline, your host for today. And with us is John Leffler, host of Steel on Steel, the cutting edge radio program that highlights trends and connects global events. And in this segment, John uh, will help us make sense of our global economy. Uh, What's on the global economical chessboard, John? 
I know that Europe is in jeopardy. That's what I know. Greece wants to exit the Eurozone. The U.S. dollar is ready to collapse and so forth. We can go on and on. But how do we connect the dots to the worldwide dilemma that we're seeing right now? Yeah, remember, by the way, that what we do on our show is uh, at SteelOnSteel.com is try to see everything through economics, politics, and religion, that mm-hmm. these things are all interrelated to each other right. and that they actually all affect each other. Uh, economically, it's really interesting. We just came through a major depression, a crash and a depression, 2007, 2008, mm-hmm. and a crisis window that extended from 2009 to 2012. Um, now everybody's waiting for the next shoe to fall. You know, we keep hearing these predictions of the imminent crash of the dollar, yada, yada, yada. That's not going to happen in the imminent, immediate future. Really? That's it's, good to it's, hear. Yeah, it's not ready to crash. Because as a result of what's happening to the euro and other currencies, look at what's going on in Japan. They're going into a, re- they're in a recession. Uh, the dollar has become the best-looking house in a bad neighborhood. Huh. And so people are rushing over to the dollar. However, the dollar is going to have its own day of reckoning, mm-hmm. maybe toward the end of this decade. The global elites, the end, the, what you call the New World Order crowd, the money elites, were talking about a new global currency by 2018. Because right now our debt is, what is it, soaring above $17 trillion yes, somewhere, there. and by yep. the time President Obama leaves office, it's going to be at 20. The euro is rickety right now, and that's, they keep trying to glue it together and glue it together. And if it blows apart, then you're going to start seeing the shock waves around the world. We have huge derivative exposures, unbelievable public and private debt that probably mm-hmm. now at this stage cannot be repaid. Right, and I so agree. because of that, the, you, know, they're, they're, you either reset everything. There are two ways off of this train once you get onto this historically, mm-hmm. and that is you either have a major crash – uh, it just blows off like that. Or you just simply reset the debt and say, all the debts are hereby forgiven. Right. And sorry if you lost money, too bad. Mm-hmm. Okay. Neither of those is very popular. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, they're not, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, okay, so you're saying in two... Go ahead. Go- okay, go ahead, John. Go ahead, well, see, God, God's built into the universe a fixed rule, okay. right? Back, way back in the Garden of Eden, he says you're going to work to buy the sweat of your brow to get food out of the ground. Mm-hmm. And money just simply delays that whole process and allows us to specialize to achieve modern society. But there is a fixed rule of the universe. There is no free lunch. No. <laughs> what one person eats, somebody else has to grow. Right. And what somebody uses, somebody else has to pay for. Mm-hmm. And inflation doesn't make that go away, as some people would think. What it does is it rolls it to the next generation. Right. And, and so the first people to get the inflated money, they make out really well. The mm-hmm. last people to get the inflated money, they're stuck with a tab. Right, exactly. All right, so I'm just backing up. You you had said that we are not seeing a crash come to I think that's the big question. I hear that all the time. So when do you think the big crash is going to happen in America? Um, now, you're saying that we're not going to see much until 2000. What did you say, 2017, 2018? Oh, we're all wet fingering 2018 to 2020. Okay. Maybe you'll start to see something in 16. I doubt it. Okay. Uh, the first thing, and some people are actually saying, well, we'll have a big bump at the end of this decade, and then the real crash will probably be the end of the next decade. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to factor this. My wife and I have a lot of conversations. She's been Mm -hmm. acting as my producer for a long time, and she (laughs) did her minor work in uh, economics. And we're saying, can they keep this game going? The world is where it's never been before right now, Cindy. That's right. I know. That's why we're talking about this. (laughs) It's really spooky. We have bits of the old, and by now we should have just blown out. We should be seeing so much inflation in our society Mm -hmm that people would be screaming. Right. Um, but we're not. We're and not. so the real question is, how long can you keep game, uh, the game going? And the politicians and the central bankers have no choice but to play this game right to the end. They have to fly this airplane right into the ground. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it seems like they're going to start, I'm, I'm not sure, but it seems like they're going to start all over again with, uh, with real estate. I don't uh, know if you see est- that coming. Yes, you're right. The real estate is the next bubble. Mm-hmm. Forming, and we're, uh, Dave McIlvaney was just saying that we produced his weekly show from International Collectors, and mm-hmm. he was just saying that today. He said the next bubble to form right. looks like another crash That's right. on the basis of home loans, which have been overvalued, mm-hmm. uh, etc. I'm sorry, automobile loans is the one he's looking oh, at okay, he okay. as a result of that. So um, we've got so much debt out there in, in that area 
I, you know, who knows? Everything is overextended. We're all playing a game. It's all a That's giant right. trade-around mm-hmm. game in which if you understand what's happening, you can make money in the process, but you better convert the money into some real asset if you're not using it. Because sooner or later, that day of reckoning is coming, and it'll start with some black swan event somewhere. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming you know what that term means. I black don't. Swan. I don't. <laughs> okay. Uh, black swan and rogue, rogue waves are both the same thing. Okay. It's something coming out of somewhere that you didn't expect. expect. Okay. It's a, it's, it, it's a little something, and it triggers everything. Like the Arab Spring, you know, mm. that was the, the, the man in Tunisia setting himself on fire to protest oh, uh, right. his, his government. Yes. Okay. And okay. boom, look what happened. A like domino that. effect, yeah. But, but what you can see, and you could see this before the Arab Spring, is, you know, we went through the Oslo peace process, and then it fell apart in 2000, then 911 was 2001. And then you could see them trying to, in what I call the post-Oslo process, trying to rev everybody up again, mm-hmm. and that wasn't working. So we moved into the post-Post-Oslo area. And at that point, you could look around and look at all these different uh, Muslim Arab countries, other countries that were involved, mm-hmm. and they were all jockeying themselves, Hamas, Hezbollah, for position. They all understood that there was going to be a big break somewhere, somehow, mm-hmm. and that when it did, they wanted to be in the position to maximize their own position. That's and that's exactly what happened with the Arab Spring. Mm-hmm. It's starting to coalesce into that again. We're not there, but you can see them doing it. It's mm-hmm. like winding up a catapult, you know. Yeah. You know it's going to be let go sooner or later. Yeah, and you know, and I want to jump over, too, uh, about with the natural resources, because I know that we're seeing the oil prices have changed dramas- uh, uh, drastically. And um, I think that natural resources can be huge game players. You know, what is going on with the oil? I mean, it seems like that, you know, we're in a good place now, but a lot of people are saying, okay, well, this is the calm before the storm. Right. And, and I totally don't understand what's going on, and yet I know that the listening audience would like to know what's happening now. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, it's a mess. Okay, it's get a mess. on to the okay. next topic. Okay, it's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, here, here's, here's the deal. It's affecting our relationships. Today, huh? I said it's, it's affecting our global relationships. You know, what's in store for us? What's the, going the, on? The wars of today are being fought over three, three primary things, okay. ideologies, currencies, and energies. Mm-hmm. Those are the three things, exactly. and they're all interactive. Uh-huh. Um, in the middle of the first decade, I was predicting, as were others, that we would have a serious energy crisis that we would be in between 2014 and 2016. Mm-hmm. It would be a peak flow crisis because daily demand was swelling so greatly and world production is being pretty constant right now mm-hmm. that we said, by the time we get there, we're going to be in serious trouble. Now, what happened? Because um, it's one of the predictions I made that I don't think didn't come true. It didn't come true in the timeline, I said. It's just been moved backwards in time sometime into the future. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, number one, there was a worldwide economic recession that dropped the demand for energy, and that spared us the increasing demand that we kept seeing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Um, And number two, the U.S. in the private sector, no thanks to our current administration, which likes to take credit for it, which has opposed further development of energies, Mm -hmm. um, they managed to bring on new technologies, new sources of oil and drilling, fracking and others, that increased the global supply. Okay. Very few people saw this energy price dump coming. It was just a combination. There's a rogue wave, black swan to you. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's exactly right. Event, yeah. right. And everybody's saying, oh, this is sort of neat. Enjoy this. All right. Mm-hmm. This will not last forever because the world dynamics are not moving mm-hmm. in that direction. Um, there are alternatives coming online. We need to encourage those, but for the next 10 or 20 years, oil and natural gas are going to be it as right. far as production. So all of this talk about we're going to have a global warming treaty and we're going to put a tax on, on carbon fuels. Now, understand, you put a tax on carbon fuels, you're putting a tax on the economy. You're loading the global economy, That's right. which means people eating or not eating. That's literally what it means. Yeah, it's going to come down. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is all nonsense. When people say we have to stop global warming, how do you do that? We stop people from using fossil fuels. How do you do that? We tax it. What mm-hmm. does that do? It gives money to the government. Does it do anything else? No. Right. <laughs> See, uh, that's all it does. And yet, at the same time, it will go the other way. So um, that's where the energy situation is. The, the alternatives are just not there in the volumes that are needed mm-hmm. to sustain us. They can be. All right, mm-hmm. but they're not there yet. Okay. And the insanity of the game that we're playing now is we're telling people we can cut off the old forms of energy before the new ones are online. This is insane. Mm-hmm. And we are putting ourselves 
strategically at risk. Look at what Europe did. It, Europe would get natural gas from where? Gazprom in Russia. Oh, well, gee, that means Putin mm -hmm. has you by whatever he's got exactly. you by, you know? Exactly. Um, and all he has to do is turn off the valve, and he can make Europe dance because they rely on that Germany, especially for power generation and mm -hmm. for heating. Uh, what, what an idiotic place yeah, to be. I know. Well, know? like I say, yeah, well, you know what's going on in the chessboard. I don't. That's why we're asking you these questions. <laughs> you know, like what's going on around here. But anyway, I'd like to move on to uh, uh, about this forfeiture thing, because I heard this on one of your programs. I never heard of it before. I did not know it was going on. I had no idea this was happening in the United States. Uh, why don't we just uh, explain to the audience? And the reason why I'm bringing this up, because it's a form of control. I know it just seems like it's uh, maybe a rabbit trail, but I wanted to cover it because, um, you know, when I heard about this on your program, I thought we need to know what's going on here. So why don't we just real quickly tell the audience what structuring and forfeiture are and then give us some okay. examples. Civil forfeiture is where property is accused of committing a crime and the property is seized from its property owner. Mm -hmm. uh, originally, this was used under RICO racketeering laws to try to take the property of drug lords, even if they couldn't get a conviction mm -hmm. on the drug lord. Unfortunately, the number of forfeiture crimes have expanded radically. And over the last 20 years, thousands of innocent Americans who've never been charged with a crime have lost their property That's and then or money and then have to fight to go and get it back. Mm -hmm. And there are dozens upon dozens upon mm -hmm. dozens of horror stories. And the police agency making the seizure at the time yes. gets to keep a big part of the money or property that is seized. Right. So literally you now have uh, legalized racketeering mm -hmm. on the part of government to extort money and property from American citizens. I can't believe they're getting away with it. I mean, I remember hearing the story about a father who sent $3,000 to his daughter in college and they forfeited his money because of uh, him having... I, I don't understand how they can do that. Did they take it from her? No, they, 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 because he bought it in the terms of... Uh, I don't know whether they... That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I'd have to go back and look at that, whether they seized his bank account. That was called structuring. Oh, structuring. And okay. Structuring was try to, trying to avoid reporting requirements for certain amounts of money, mm -hmm. and that's called structuring. And that was, again, to try to get uh, RICO people, people engaged in organized crime, uh, and if you deliberately try to make several deposits to try to avoid a big deposit in order to, you know, that's structuring. Well, there is a reform bill before Congress, which is really important that we support, called the FAIR Act. It's just been introduced in both the House and the Senate to try to reform some of these most egregious things, saying that just because someone makes multiple deposits, like there was an owner of a restaurant, um, Mexican restaurant who always made cash deposits, and they said, "Well, you're structuring." No, those were her daily receipts. Well, they seized. I forget how many, how much money. In Second Timothy chapter three, we read that men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers without self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. They will be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Thank you for having a love for the truth. Uh, we've been having a wonderful discussion with John Leffler on global affairs and how they connect with the global uh, goal of becoming a one world order or one world, world faith. We can see some of these things lining up. And before we went on the break, we were talking about uh, unlawful kind of, it seems like unlawful control happening here when it comes to our money. We were talking about structuring and forfeiture. And uh, John, if you want to continue in your thoughts before the break, that would be great. Well, the problem with forfeiture is that someone could have their property forfeited. They could be totally innocent. They may have been an innocent owner where something was illegally going on on their property, say a landlord, and yet their property will be seized. Mm -hmm. uh, the property is charged with the crime. And if you don't That's believe me, go look up the cases where it says the United States versus $7,650, oh, wow. wow. you know, um, rather than versus the person. The property does not have rights mm -hmm. because like we do mm -hmm. and therefore the property owner has to start an action pay for an attorney go to court and try to get his property back now if the property seized is too little he just gives it up but it wasn't worth the government's effort to do it right. if it's too much the property owner will go to get it back so they've been tuning 
seizures to try to collect the maximum amount of money. As a matter of fact, there have been studies being done mm-hmm. that show the actual attention goes to forfeiture rather than stopping the, the drug trafficking. That's unbelievable. It actually shifts, you know. Yeah. Um, and so this has just been, it's been bogus. There are, especially in like up Highway 95 uh, in your part of the country, yes. there have been uh, police patrols looking for people coming up from Florida oh my because goodness. this is a major corridor for money and drugs. Mm-hmm and stopping and then asking questions about how much money you have in the car and what this is called is policing for profit yes they're not they're there to try to find out if there's money worth seizing in the car and then if you have say six seven eight nine ten thousand dollars in the car which is not illegal to carry by the way right. uh, they say well this could be drug money so we're going to seize it oh my goodness That's it. it's so, gone wow so there's a real control happening right now where people really would be afraid to carry large amounts of money i mean what if you're on vacation and you're going uh, let's say we're going down to florida or to or to costa rica or whatever we need to have cash on us that's really that's terrible uh, no, no it's it, it's been widely abused for 25 years mm-hmm. i've been screaming about it we finally have a bill called the fair act mm-hmm. um which i think people need to support it addresses all of these abuses especially structuring oh, good. um etc it was really neat a week ago the head of the internal revenue service apologized for all the small businesses they'd seized the money from i oh, thought well goodness. will you give them the money back Will you, rest, will you pay them for their expenses and the time and the lost money they had when you wrecked their businesses, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, really? It, I, yeah, it just, it just seems unlawful to me and, and just a lack of justice there for the people. It just seems like, uh, just like the Bible says, that we're counting right for wrong and wrong for right these days. It, it seems like it's happening everywhere. Um, and especially this control, not only over our money, but over our property, uh, as you were saying. And, you know, when we see that money and that, uh, you know, uh, control over money and over property, it seems like it's going more to a communistic type of government. Would you agree to that? Yes, we're moving into an mm-hmm. oligarchic dictatorship, mm-hmm. which is very socialistic. Um, this is probably yes. one of the most dangerous types of situations wow. in that we are more and more Congress is becoming irrelevant. The administrative branch is making all the rules, and if right. Congress won't do it, they'll make them up as they go along. Mm-hmm. And these rules are being made in such a way as to end run the protection set in the law. They're created by thousands of faceless, faceless, unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats. Mm -hmm. And when you try to get your own rights to assert your rights, they'll do two things. Um, You don't know which agency you have to go back against because it's it, the the path, the legal path, is very vague. Mm -hmm. But second of all, they will penalize you heavily. How wow. dare you try to assert your rights? And they'll mm-hmm. just pile more and more stuff on till people break and give up. Mm-hmm. That's what they're doing it's right really now. It's really a form of abuse. It, it's very much a form of abuse. It's definitely Never, form- be, you know, this whole nonsense, like Jim Wallace at Sojourners, that the mm-hmm. purpose of government is to redistribute wealth and all this sort of right. stuff. This is garbage and nonsense. It's bogus, yeah. Government is not a source of beneficial things. Mm-mm. Whatever it gives to one person, it has to choke out of three other people to pay for That's it. That's right. And the, and the reason it has to choke it out of three people is because it's one to transfer the money and two to pay the government. That's okay. right. Yeah, and I'll um, tell you with so. the small businesses, we own a small business. It just seems like they're choking us, not only with, uh, you know, whether it's penalties or more taxes or whatever, it's more standards. It just seems like the middle guy is, is going to be out of the equation soon, you know. Right. It's, it's big business, big government, and mm-hmm. oligarchic big government and big business mm-hmm. that are now in partnership with each other. And you're right, the middle class loses, the small yes. business loses, because everybody's drowning uh, under taxes and regulation. Those mm-hmm. are the two things. Ask any small business owner, what's your biggest opposition? And it'll just come right out. Taxes. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and everything I have to do to keep the governments happy. That's right. So, you know, we're looking at this and things have gone wrong politically. We can see that. Um, I see, John, these birth pangs are becoming quicker and harder. And I know I keep fo- focusing yeah. on the birthing of a new world order, but it just seems like it's becoming more imminent. Now, we don't know how to connect the dots. I was hoping that you can connect some of them. But uh, we see that the chessboard, the global chess chessboard right now suggests clever pawn positioning in, like you said, in, in, in many realms. Um, but why don't we look at globally what's going on politically? 
You know, we have Yemen collapsing before our eyes. The Ukraine is at war with Russia rebels. Uh, Putin is up to something. Iran is ready for nuclear war, while all eyes are on is uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, I remember your last show, you said, yeah, everything's looking mad, mad, mad. It's a mad world out there. It just seems like everything is crumbling uh, around. We see people like myself who uh, know very little about what's going on globally, and yet we're seeing this on the news, and it just seems like everything is collapsing. And well, that's, an uproar. That's, that's the top level that you're seeing that out. Remember mm-hmm. that the, the globalist crowd, I call them the one-worlders, mm-hmm. um, they operate off of a no-lose, no-lose scenario. And what that means is, you know, sometimes you talk about win-win, win-lose, this and that. And what they basically do is, no matter what happens, no matter which side wins, they are always in a position to make it work in their favor. So it's what I call a no-lose, no-lose scenario. Mm-hmm. And that's what you're seeing right now. Um, dialecticians, by the way, love all this chaos okay. because it lets them get lots of stuff done. People are willing to give up rights that they gotcha. would ordinarily yeah. complain about. Right. They allow things to happen to their monetary systems they would ordinarily complain about. Um, laws get put in. The One World was originally saw the United Nations, you know, back in the middle of the last century. They right. were viewing the United Nations as being the succession to the League of Nations, which was going to be our new global government. That didn't work. So now what they're trying to do is to pull things together in regional alliances. That's why you see all these regional right. partnerships going on. That's mm-hmm. the next thing. Um, and, you know, you go back to Richard Gardner back in Council on Foreign Relations, Public Affairs, uh, Foreign Affairs Journal back in 1974, who said the way to get to global government is through regional government, through steps, Right. By doing an end run around national sovereignty. Okay. And the end run is we just keep turning. Remember I said that oligarchic dictatorship mm-hmm. where it's not really clear who the authority is and where That's the laws right. are coming from and where your rights are coming from? That's what we're That's seeing. That's what's happen. happening exactly. both at the international level uh, and at the national level. And, you know, you can see this in the European Union. You see it here. Mm-hmm. The other things that are taking us toward the end, notice that Jesus said nation would rise against nation That's right. as the beginning of the birth pangs. Mm-hmm. and. In reality, the Greek word ethnos is what we're seeing. Ethnic yes. groups are rising against ethnic groups across right. traditional, cultural, tribal boundaries, not That's across right. these modern boundary lines. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're seeing that for the first time in the world, all of the currencies of the world are inflationary, just like is described in the book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. We've never been here before on this. That's right. Um, I'm not sure where the global, you know, the the beast and the global religion come along. Mm -hmm. But remember that when we get to this new beast, it's a beast that is something that is different that the world has never seen before. Mm -hmm. It has, like the statue of Daniel, it has toes of clay Mm -hmm. and of iron. Parts of it are strong, parts of it are weak and brittle, but it's all clutched together. Right. Okay. And that's what it's looking like. And you can actually see those things. Not only that, the push of Jews to return to Israel. That's right. You see that going on. Yeah. Um, so it, it's amazing the things that we can see, but one thing is definite, it is not coming together according to the scenario that we kept getting laid out in the, seven, in the 70s and the 80s and the, mm-hmm. you know, um, what I call the Home Alone After the Rapture series. Yes, and, and then I, 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 I do have a question, though, real quick, uh, real quick about the beast. Uh, back in the 70s, like you said, I remember being in a Bible study and we were talking about Revelation, and... The beast, uh, this pastor said, was going to be a huge computer in Brussels that would have uh, everything, like all the natural resources uh, in this uh, computer. It would be like a one-world computer. And eventually that the uh, nations would have to come together because of the natural resources. Now, do you know anything about that? Well, that's where computer technology is heading. I know you've had Pat mm-hmm. Wood on the program before. Yes, he I talks have. about technocracy. Yeah, exactly. We, we now have computers that are able to, we're, we're rapidly developing a new generation of computers that mm-hmm. can learn and think uh, independently. No, They're scary. not just pre programmed. Yes. And so this is the direction that you're seeing. Remember that in the technocracy, it, part of this new oligarchic socialism that I'm talking about, they need feedback loops. Feedback loops have to make sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to do to make it all work. Work. And in order to do that, you have to know everything everybody's doing. That's right. So So that could well be it. You look at the beast, remember the statue of the beast that's able to do all these things? Mm -hmm. We're moving into that generation of computers where we may have a hard time telling human from 
from artificial intelligence. That's that's very scary. And I remember we were talking about technocracy, which I did have Patrick Wood on the show, and he was saying that all our uh, appliances in our home have these little chips in there that can depict, you know, how much you're using the appliances, how much energy you're putting out, how much energy is coming in, and eventually we're going to be looked at as an energy source to see if, uh, you know, we are... Um, Oh, I don't know how to say it, valuable to the globe. <laughs> you know, are we are we giving into society as much as we're taking out? So we're going to be looked at as just an energy source, not a human. Right. Being. That's why we talk about human resources. You're just a cog in this oh, technological yeah. wheel. That's right. See, that this whole group that promotes this technocracy, mm -hmm. they are not Christians. Okay, and right. so they don't have a Christian worldview about the innate value of that's mankind. Right. And. Listen, politicians can talk about human worth and human rights and human values all they want. Mm -hmm. That's not what this crowd believes. That's no. the hardcore underlying base underneath it. Uh, there were many people that originally supported Adolf Hitler in the 30s that were very surprised to find out that his reality was different than his rhetoric. That's right. And, and speaking of Hitler now, you know, we're hearing a lot. Uh, I don't know if you heard of Anita Dittman. She gives her story. She used to be, uh, uh, she was one of the refugees that fled from Hitler's, uh, you know, thing over there. But anyway, um, she actually says that America is looking like Germany did uh, before, basically before Hitler was able to take over. Are you seeing that? Are we? Is America getting to that point? Yeah, we look. We look very much like it. Look, history does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Okay. okay, you will pass through the same things, and we are looking like Germany did in terms of rejecting previous values, talking about a big bold future. Okay, um, moving into a socialist type of arrangement, and now we're at this this whole hate idea of you know. Who's good? Who's bad? What you can say? What you can't say? Right. That political concerns me. political correctness is killing us. I was going to say that literally killing us. That really concerns okay. me. It really does because there's more of a control there, and a lot of abuse is happening. The same thing. Uh, so, uh, you know, what do you see? I, I would really like to know, John. Where is the U.S. headed? Because you know, we hear a lot of people saying that we're going to see uh, all kinds. Of, well, anyway, we're going on a break, so maybe we could. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about uh, the advice that you can give to those uh, that are going through some of these things. And uh, we're going on a break right now, so stay tuned. We're going to hear how we can connect or contact John Leffler. You're listening to Love for the Truth Radio. We'll be right back, so please stay tuned. I want to personally thank you for listening to Love for the Truth Radio. Please visit our website at www.lovefortheTruthRadio.com. That's www.lovefortheTruthRadio.com. Well, we have come to the conclusion of our show with John Leffler on global affairs and how they connect with the global uh, or goal of becoming a one world order and one world faith. John, you gave us a lot of information. I really appreciate all that you have. Uh, you're a man filled with wisdom. Uh, now, are we uh, optimistic or pessimist? Um, Christians should always be optimistic, because we know that in the end things get very, very bad, but that's not for us. Jesus said, lift up, you know, when you mm -hmm. see all these things, lift up your head, because your redemption draws not. Um, in every situation, there will be an opportunity for the gospel. People will be looking for answers. In every situation, try to understand what's happening, mm -hmm. and then do what you need to do that's appropriate to deal with the situation, whether that's financially or spiritually. And one of the ways to do that, in a time when you may not be able to think your way through that, is to just pray. You need to constantly follow God at every turn. Amen. Amen to that. How can we get in touch with you, John? Uh, our website is steelonsteel.com, and we have a weekly 90-minute radio program. Um, actually, it's 70 minutes when we take the commercials out, but we also have an intelligence brief that's posted there as well. This is a verbal briefing. We don't publish it. Uh, we do it, and it's by subscription. If people want to go to our website, steelonsteel.com, and use the promo code TAKE30, they can get a 30% discount. Normally, it's $7 a month, mm -hmm. and uh, but just use the promo code TAKE30. We have a lot of other material that's available at steelonsteel.com. That's great, and it's a wealth of information, so it's well worth it. Thank you, John, so much for being on the show today. And uh, we just thank you, audience, for uh, listening, and we just say God bless and have a great week. Yeah, we'll do it again. Okay, thanks. <laughs>